And now may I request the author, the great scholar. Namaskar. And Dovaji, thank you for organizing it. Actually, for each of my four books, when the publisher said, who'd be your, give me a list of three people to uh, inaugurate the book, each time, actually, Arun Shori was number one choice. So, I'm delighted that finally I have that, uh, that moment. Because I feel that he's opened the door, he's the uh, person who's opened the door to uh, original thinking from the Indian point of view with intellectual rigor and courage. And so others like us can then follow. This is Arunji's uh, gift to us. I would like to first locate the book in a bigger framework, starting with what is the relevance of a nation's grand narrative. A nation must have a grand narrative, Mahakahani, something about who we are, where we've come from, why we are together, what we share and cherish, what are our issues, how do we want to go into the future, this sort of a grand narrative, you know, academics call this thing a grand narrative. This can be on several criteria, and we should evaluate what the different nations have used as their criteria, and then see what could be India's grand narrative. And then I will explain to you why, after doing this quick analysis, I will explain to you why I feel that India's grand narrative has to be philosophical unity, what I call the dharma civilization. That has to be the basis of Indian grand narrative. But let me first give you a few other examples. Japan is a homogeneous race. So their grand narrative is, you know, one race, ethnicity, one language, and so they're all together because of that. And so all the hard work they do as, as a nation is that this large family, think of it like a jati, huge jati, it, it, it is their narrative. In the case of China, it's more uniform language they used to have many languages, but they standardized on Mandarin because the Mandarin people took over, hegemonically took over many other languages. At one time, there were many more languages. And so this uniformity of Mandarin state policy, everybody must learn Mandarin, is a very strong building block for their narrative. And um, everyone is required to study initially in Mandarin, while English is a language, it's a second language. It's not a medium of instruction. I had a nice discussion with uh, somebody in Mumbai who writes these editorials for Times of India. He's a very prominent thinker, and he was sitting in the audience, uh, and during the interaction, he said, aren't we lucky that China is also following our example of English, and English is a big asset, and China is also validating that. And what I had to point out is that China, in China, it's, Mandarin is the mother tongue, it's the medium of instruction, English comes as a language that you learn, that you can articulate and speak for, with other people, but it is not the way you're going to think. Whereas in India, we have, uh, you know, in Punjab, Punjabi schools are being shut down and turned into English medium schools. This is happening everywhere. So this idea of a uniform language that China has has helped them a lot. And they say, see their origin as Confucian thought. Confucian thought, and they say that they are modern, Confucian modernity, not Western modernity. So this is also an interesting point. In the Indian narrative, or the, one of the problems with an Indian narrative is a lot of people think that if you, have, if you believe in the Dharmic civilization, then you have to sacrifice modernity. Whereas if you want to be modern, you better become westernized and reject all those ancient things. In China, they have married, married the two, and they call it Confucian modernity, which means we are modernizing, but not westernizing. This is very interesting. And China has started over 100 Confucian institutes all over the world to propagate their, their narrative, their grand narrative through IMAX theaters, through workshops, media briefings, you know, a lot of uh, museums and so on. So if you go around the world, you'll find uh, some are based on a sense of history, like the English field, they, their Magna Carta, their contributions to the law, to democracy, the royal family, the British Empire. So they have this grand narrative of who we are, and every child learns that. The French teach their children, besides the language, 
which is compulsory, <laughs> they teach their children they are the inheritors of the Renaissance, the great European awakening and Renaissance, they are the inheritors of that. So they have a very positive narrative. The Russians have a positive narrative. The Arabs have a grand narrative of who they are. So the question is, what is the Indian grand narrative? What, and if you ask this question, you get many different answers. You even get a lot of uh, trouble from people who find the question problem, problematic because they really, uh, deep down don't believe in a unified India. They say we don't need a uh, grand narrative. We need it. There is a Dalit narrative, there is a minority narrative, <coughs> there is a narrative of Northeast people or this or that. So it's a lot of little narratives from below that are competing and conflicting with one another and no grand narrative that can bring them together. Now in the United States, which is also a diverse nation, like India is, has many kinds of people. There are importance given to establishing a sense of grandeur of history is huge. It is called, their grand narrative has an official name. It's called American exceptionalism. If you search American exceptionalism, there's a huge narrative on that. They start in the, in the 1800s. And every president who is asked, you know, what is your view on American exceptionalism? And he better say he believes in it, because otherwise, why is he president? He's not proud of a great nation. The Christian version has to do with we are the greatest Christian nation, and, and so on. And you know, there's a narrative based on Christianity, Judeo Christianity, which is the American religion. And the secular uh, left wing, left or center version is based on we're the most scientific people and the most progressive and greatest amount of accomplishments and all sorts of things. And there's something very special about being an American that makes you very superior. So this idea of American exceptionalism as the grand narrative is encoded in their monuments, big huge monuments larger than life in every state capital, in their parades, in their flag, in their anthem, all their sporting, sporting events have the national anthem. So they're very proud people. Americans are very proud people. Uh, I was having a debate with uh, one of these uh, leftist uh, scholars in Delhi, and he said the problem with America is they don't have a history. And I said, but they have a sense of history. And what matters is not whether you have a history, but whether you have a sense of history. We have a history, but don't have a sense of history. So what matters is whether the history is real. It's what you believe about yourself. It's like corporate brand, which mobilizes all the people. It's like family history. family So this sense of nation and sense of grand narrative are interlinked. And we, we, we haven't had that national debate and discussion on who are we and what is our grand narrative. And I'm hoping that if there's a change in government, one of the projects would be to, uh, to better document our, our grand narrative and make it loud and clear. For instance, there is a Ministry of Culture, but instead of, you know, Bollywood, and you know these kind of things which are important i'm not saying that pop culture is a bad thing but pop culture cannot be our grand narrative the grand narrative is deeper roots deeper roots in the past a sense of continuity a sense of uh, uniform a sense of everybody included in something so with that background what i have uh, what i have developed in this book uh, is 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 what i call the open architecture that there is a dharmic open architecture in which all sorts of things can belong, like the internet is an open architecture. So many things can come and be members into this system. This is continuous, and as Arunji said, it's evolving, it's not frozen in time, and as Dovaji said, the tree is different every day, and yet it's the same tree. So in that sense, this is evolving, and yet it's the same in, 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 in its DNA. So. This open architecture, in my previous book, Being Different, I had called it integral unity. I had called it integral unity and contrasted with synthetic unity. The West is synthetic unity. They don't have this real deep uh, unifying architecture like we do. It's a synthesis of a whole lot of things put together. But I was looking for a Sanskrit term, and I found uh, Indrajal. Indrajal in the Atharvaved, so hence I call it Indra's net. Indrajal in the Atharvaved is described as follows that it's an infinite net of jewels in all directions, where each jewel 
reflects all the other jewels. That's the cosmos. The cosmos is a collection of jewels, infinite in all directions, where every jewel reflects all the other jewels, which means each of you reflects the whole cosmos. You have, in your body, you have a map of the whole macrocosm. Every electron includes the whole cosmos. Every ant is a, is a mirror or a map of the whole system. So this means that things are inseparable. Things are interlinked. Things are interpenetrating, interbeing. These are some fancy terms that postmodernists use. But the Atharva Ved idea of Indrajal is the earliest philosophical uh, in, you know, representation, philosophical explanation of what the postmodernists are now talking about. Now this, uh, this Indrajal idea, or Indra's net, got exported into Buddhism. And I explained this in the book. Uh, it became the central paradigm of Buddhism. There is a Avatamsak Sutra in Huayan Buddhism in China. They translated it into Mandarin from Sanskrit. And they quote it. And they luckily they did not distort the word or hide it or modify it and call it, you know, Ming net or some Qing net or something. They call it Indra's net in the Chinese. They call it Indra's net. And so it's referred to the source. And that's very good for me so I can trace how it's traveled. So this idea of Indra's net becomes the central philosophy of Buddhist interdependency. You know Buddhism as talking about interdependency of everything. And so uh, we know that it's linked with Hinduism, but one of, one of the things I've done in this book is to be able to pinpoint which sutra went where, how it came from the Vedas and where it went into the Buddhism to show that link very precisely. And from Huayan Buddhism, which is considered China's most advanced philosoph philosophical Buddhism, it goes into Japan as Zen, and it goes into Korea, Korean Buddhism. And then, when Americans become Buddhists, and b became a passion for a lot of you know, white Americans to become Buddhists, uh, they bring this idea of Indra's net into American thought. So you'll see physicists writing books, if you search, you'll find books called uh, Indra's Net and Chaos Theory, where it's sort of the metaphor for how chaos gets organized. It's a metaphor for holography, a metaphor for quantum physics, Indra's Net. You see Indra's Net being used for environmentalism and ecology, for social harmony, how a lot of diversity can be in social harmony. So Indra's Net became a, a, a big thing but unfortunately, in India, people hardly knew about it. People, when you say Indra's net, people don't know. In fact, one person thought that it, the book is about Indira Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that, and he told me that Aapka spelling thik nia Indra ka. <laughs> and he thought this is some kind of Indra Gandhi must have had some kind of a network, you know. <laughs> so, and then a journalist from Times of India, a very nice guy, very senior guy, actually was interviewing me a couple of weeks ago for some article on this. So he started by asking, Ke, why are you writing on black magic? So I said, there's nothing to do with black magic. He says, no, but Indrajal is black magic. So I said, who told you so? So he says, in Times of India, we came up with a comic uh, series and we had Indrajal about all the Jadu Kunai. <laughs> so the amazing thing is that something so grand from our civilization travels around the globe. It goes to Buddhism, China, Japan, then goes to America, and then it is seen as the metaphor for so many great grand things today in science and philosophy, the whole idea of Indra's net. And yet in its land of origin, either people don't know it, or they know it in a very negative way, because somebody like Times of India you know, turned it into a pejorative. So one of the reasons I put this on the map is to argue this, or put it on the cover, is to be able to explain to people and give them this uh, insight into what Indra's name is. Before that, I was going to title the book Defense of Vivekananda, because it's his 150th anniversary. And then I expanded the title and was going to call it uh, Defense of Contemporary Hinduism. So now I go into what, what those things are, why, why, why it is act, the book is actually, why it's called Indra's Net and it talks about the unity and continuity of the cosmos, of our traditions and so on, but why it is actually a very strong defense of Swami Vivekananda and contemporary Hinduism. There is a, it is very interesting that starting in the 1950s, 
a man named Paul Hacker, as Arunji mentioned. He started, he started uh, uh, a new thesis after you know, 20 years of being a very eminent Sanskrit scholar, very well known, done some very original work in linguistics and so on, Sanskrit linguistics. He started this thesis and he coined the, he's the one who coined the term Neo-Hinduism. And he said that Hinduism, as defined by Vivekananda and hence all the followers of Vivekananda, is not really authentic because the unity that he talks about is not real, it does not exist in the past. And it, 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 it's the inferiority complex of Vivekananda from British that caused him to appropriate many Western things and rephrase them in Sanskrit so that Hindus, India would be proud and this would create a national unity to fight against the British. So he needed something common which didn't really exist and he needed it to be positive and on par with British ideas. So he came up with this hodgepodge, put it together, put a nice you know, label on it and uh, to, to give it a nationalist uh, kind of uh, you know, political spin. And this is how what we call Hinduism started, but more appropriately it should be called Neo-Hinduism. That was his philosophy. And it wasn't taken very seriously right away, but then an American named Harfas in the University of Pennsylvania, a very eminent Indologist, most Indians like him a lot. He and actually he's written very, a lot of good things because they, these people are mixed up. They talk from both sides. So Harfast invites this guy to University of Pennsylvania, and he becomes a visiting professor. He gets a lot of importance. And then there is an there is a Viennese called uh, Agehanand Bharati. He had become a, become a monk in India. He had taken initiation, become a monk, and he wrote a lot of books called the Ochre Robe and so on. He takes this idea and develops it even further and he uh, you know he turns against hinduism in his later years and he gives a lot of weight to this idea of neo hinduism <coughs> and then it goes to england where uh, a, a minister an anglican minister <coughs> ursula king who's uh, who's still alive i think she at least a few years ago i met her uh, she was up in year age in age she took this idea and uh, gave it a political uh, grounding and said that basically this whole idea uh, was, uh, he, she emphasized the political dimension of uh, what Vivekananda was trying to do and tried to show that this is not really a genuine religion, it's kind of phony. And the major change that brings this idea to the Indian left, this is what's interesting. It used to be just in the academy. But then she brought an Indian called Anand Rambachan uh, from the Caribbean region. And he's very well grounded in. Uh, in Advaita Vedanta, he goes to ashrams and gives talks. Uh, today, he's been built up as a very important spokesman and scholar of Hinduism. But at that time, he was a young man. And so she, she gives him a PhD. And his PhD is on how Shankara's Vedanta is violated by Vivekananda. So he gives it a philosophical legitimacy, this new Hinduism, uh, seeing the Hinduism as a fake construct and not very legitimate, he gives it a philosophical grounding that philosophically speaking, what is what Vivekananda and future people after that, including Aurobindo, Gandhi, all these guys, what they are calling Hinduism today is not really compatible with Adi Shankara and comes up with some very sophisticated arguments. Now, from the work of these people, these four or five, each of them given a lot of coverage in my book, and I call that part one, Purva Paksha, my view of the other side. And then I'm going to refute them in the second part, which I call Uttar Paksha. So these four or five major figures, they generate a big echo effect in India. The first person is Ramila Thapar, who writes an article, a very influential article, called Syndicated Hinduism, in which he says Hinduism, according to these Western people, she doesn't know Sanskrit, she's not a philosopher, she is not capable of either understanding Shankara or understanding Vivekananda. She has no real ba basis for doing all this, but she's a historian with a lot of political baggage. So she comes up with this article called Syndicated Hinduism, the thesis, and she basically based on these other scholars' work. She's just building, she's just taking that same thing and giving it a new spin. She says that Hinduism is a syndicated uh, kind of a construction. This syndicate is a elitist upper caste Hindus who created this thing to oppress minorities, oppress Dalits, oppress women. And Vivekananda started it, and then the Hindutva people continued taking it further. And this becomes then the talking points of the left, because given Ramana Thapar's power and influence, whole lot of people, 
following that lineage. And I show, I have a whole chapter showing, you know, Pankaj Mishra writes this kind of stuff, Jyotir Maya Sharma writes this kind of stuff, uh, this uh, Ramachandra Guha writes this stuff, uh, Shashi Tharoor writes these kind of things, uh, Sunil Thilnani, all these kind of guys who are celebrated big shots, they write this kind of stuff, they get awards, the uh, highly colonized Jaipur Literary Festival full of these kind of people. <laughs> Somebody, some, uh, one of the other literary festivals, I was in Bangalore, they were talking to me about my book, and so I told them this is a problem. And he said, Aapko to, uh, literary festival, jake, you should talk about all this. So I said, Those people are the ones that I'm exposing, so how do invite them? So he said, hum, Hamara bhi ek festival hai, hum, invite them. So he introduced me to this, and this man is a big industrialist, and he's, uh, he's got the clout. So he called the fellow who's running the literary festival in Bangalore and he said we should bring Rajiv in September and have him a major plenary address. And so this young man asked me, he's very excited and all that, and then he asked me ki aapka topic kya hoga? So I said my topic will be decolonizing India's literary festivals. <laughs> so, so let's see if the Gatekeepers along the way will accept it, but at least he was very, first he was very scared, then he said, ha, acha, I cannot take it. <laughs> now, why is it colonized? Because uh, William Barry Limple, sitting in London, runs and controls all the Indian literary festivals, except for one or two. He's got a team in every place, the teams are all 100% Indian, they're very sophisticated, which are being promoted, the ideologies and spins which are being legitimized. Ultimate authority is one man sitting in London, what a, what a major power structure that is, and nobody has taken him apart, and I, I intend to write on this uh, whole thing. So, uh, this business of uh, neo-Hinduism uh, says that Vedant and Yoga are incompatible, philosophically and practically, they're incompatible. You could, traditionally, you could be a Vedantin, never do yoga, or you could be yogi and don't do Vedant. And Vivekananda has fabricated this unity and it doesn't really work. This is one of their theses. Another is that Karma Yoga of Vivekananda was a fabrication. Interesting. And in the Gita, their argument is in the Gita, Karma Yoga is mentioned, but Karma Yoga is for an individual to get moksha. So I am to do Karma Yoga for my moksha, not helping, my, helping other people. Karma Yoga is not helping other people, but helping myself through as moksha. And, and this idea of helping other people, according to this thesis, is a Christian idea of charity. And, and Vivekanan, when he went to America, found that they are doing so much better because they are charitable people. But he wanted to come up with an Indian term and bring Christian charity into India. So he, he, re, he, modulated, he modified the idea of Karma Yoga to include charity, and that's why Karma Yoga is here, but it really doesn't fit into Indian philosophy. Now, one of the, uh, per, the, the, one of the, the Paul Hacker mentions that he is actually saying he knows the exact date when uh, Vivekananda appropriated it. And there is a certain date he cites when Vivekananda is in Bombay, and, they, and, and uh, there is another very famous German Sanskrit scholar called Paul Doyson. Paul Doyson was a Schopenhauer's prime student. Schopenhauer was interested in Indian philosophy, and Paul Doyson was a top student. And he was visiting Bombay and he gave a lecture. And uh, because Vivekananda's dates were coinciding, therefore the assumption is that Vivekananda heard the lecture. And because Doyson said something, Vivekananda must have picked it up from there. And because Doyson is a Westerner, therefore it must be a Western appropriation. But when you look at the facts, what Doyson wrote about was, uh, he, he, he came up with this idea that Tattva Masi, from the Upanishads, you are that, is a fantastic reason to help you, help each other. The basis of love, karuna, compassion, philanthropy, is because I am that and you are that. And since we are both the same and we are both divine, so this is the basis for my compassion for you. This is the idea of Tattva Masi. And Vivekanan does have a, in his writings, he uses the term Tattva Masi ethics. He uses that phrase, Tattva Masi ethics, uh, when he's describing what he calls practical Vedanta, which means Vedanta in action, social action. 
So because of this link, the, state, the claim is being made by the Neo-Hinduism school that uh, the Tattva Messi is some idea that Vivekananda got from Western people. But if you look at Doyson's own works, this is the sort of thing that Arun Shuri does a lot, go behind and look at the original source and, and you find out that it says something different. So when you look at Doyson's own works on Tattva Masi, Doyson actually criticizes Christianity for not having a philosophy on which charity can be based. Because he says Christians are charitable out of obedience. They've been told you should be charitable. It's out of fear, so they're doing charity to get to heaven. But since they don't have this idea of unity of people, uh, each one being divine, they don't have the principle of immanence, that God is immanent in all of us. God is immanent everywhere. Since they don't have that, therefore their, uh, their approach to charity is not philosophically grounded. And Doyson proposes that Tattva Messi is, is something that, China, that uh, Christians should import from Vedas in order to have a philosophical basis for charity. So the, his thesis is actually not, he's bringing a Christian idea to us, he's bringing a Vedic idea to Christianity. And so whether Vivekananda got it from him or not is immaterial, the point is it's a Vedic idea, wherever uh, Vivekananda might have picked it up from. So in this manner, I take one point at a time and give my, give my uh, response to it. Now, the last few chapters of the book are where I do something I'll be probably I'll be attacked for being very aggressive. And I keep that for the last chapter because by then I think I've got the reader in. So now now he can do whatever, but I've got enough ideas in him already that now he could do whatever, it doesn't matter, I can really take the risk. So this is where I have uh, I'm talking about the problem we are facing. The open architecture, being too open, is vulnerable to being co-opted, hijacked, because it allows anybody, and to being uh, uh, digested, what I call digestion, which means, you know, a tiger eats a goat, and there is no more goat left, because all the parts have been broken down into small <laughs> atoms and re re reformed into the tiger's body. So what is left is a strong tiger, but no more goat. So we are being digested. Uh, yoga is turning into Christian yoga, Bharatanatyam, we have Christian version of Bharatanatyam. So a whole lot of our ideas are being reformulated as, as Judeo-Christianity or as Western science. Uh, one of the books I'm writing is on Buddhist contributions to neuroscience and cognitive science to show that the cutting edge of neuroscience and cognitive science in the West is based on a lot of Buddhist ideas along with some yoga in Hindu ideas. So this digestion is a serious problem that the open architecture must deal with. So I have uh, remedies in this, because I've always been asked, what's your remedy? And one of my principles to defend the open architecture, I call it the porcupine defense. Porcupine is an animal that is not aggressive, but it has these quills. And if the tiger tries to swallow him, the tiger will cut his internal organs and may even die. So porcupine is saying, I'm not harming you, but if you try to eat me up, you'll kill yourself. So the porcupine defense is a kind of uh, strategy which says, I, no first strike. I'm not striking you, but if you strike me, you will also self-destruct. This is the, and therefore it's a deterrent. It's an interesting kind of deterrent. And I explain how philosophically certain things can serve as porcupine defense, which means that we deter the predator from eating us up. We're not harming him, but we don't want him to harm us. And then related to this is another uh, concept which I call the poison pill. <coughs> poison pill is ki mithai ke andar poison dali hai, and you offer it. If the, it's delicious, the person wants to eat it. When he eats it, he'll be poisoned. So this is the poison. The poison pill is different than porcupine defense in the sense that porcupine defense is very visible and it's a deterrent, and he stays away. Poison pill is inside. He doesn't quite know what he's getting into, but as he starts doing yoga, as he starts getting higher and higher experiences, he's not going to believe in this organized church. He's not going to believe in this institution. He's not going to believe that God is somewhere else because he's had an experience. So his, his ideas of, uh, say, an Abrahamic religion will be poisoned. 
they will make that that fixation he will no longer be in bondage to those kind of ideas and he will be liberated from the clutches of a church or an institution or what i call history centrism or some kind of an exclusive ideology so poison pill is a positive thing it's like zen koans it's like uh, the trishul of uh, shiva is not uh, negative uh, kind of killing but it dissolves ignorance so poison pill actually dissolves the ignorant ego that is its, its purpose so i have uh, uh, in detail explained some of the ingredients of our tradition which we must never give up which must be included in teaching of every part of our culture these principles should be included because these principles are not digestible into the abrahamic traditions and if they are digested they cause harm to the abrahamic religion in other words there is an incompatibility and if these principles are taken in and assimilated then the person no longer can be a christian or no longer can be a muslim so these are uh, poison pill strategies that i leave in this book at the end and then finally i have a uh, re reinterpreted astika and nastika reinterpreted astika and nastika many of you would think that astika means believing in the vedas and nastika is not believing in the vedas that's only one uh, idea of astika and nastika i show that over history astika and nastika is has been a debated uh, category there was a, there was a time when uh, you know manu believed that uh, people who are uh, uh, obedient who are living a certain lifestyle certain quality uh, are astika then then hari bhadra a jain scholar came up with astika as anybody who believes in an afterlife and who believes in virtue and has good you know ethics so the idea of astika as a sort of sense of who we are and nastika is the others who are not part of us the boundaries have been changing the boundary of us then has existed and it has been changing so i am proposing a new astika today uh, to in this book i am saying that those who subscribe to the open architecture are astika and this requires mutual respect this requires i can have any ishta devta and so can you i can't claim mine is the only one it requires certain principles like that and i show that the literal interpretation and the fundamentalist interpretation of the abrahamic religions will not accept astika will not want to be in astika because of the conditions of membership so it's like you can come it's an open architecture but you cannot have hatred for others you cannot want to undermine others you cannot be exclusivist you cannot be like a cancer wanting to have expansion keep expanding at other people's expense so as long as you come conform to good citizenship good behavior of the astika in in other words you're upholding the values of the open architecture you're most welcome you could be any person of any faith any from any part of the world any any historical background if you comply with this you can be part of astika but if you are going to endanger the open architecture then you are not so what i do is i i give the choice to the other side i am not evaluating what is christianity whether they good or bad or islam or this or that i'm saying every individual should make a choice they can come from that religion what is their choice in this criteria that i've laid out and when i was giving a very short snippet of this talk in mumbai there was a small gathering and one very prominent person stood up and said i have a lot of good friends who are christians and muslims they are very good indians they are tax payers they support our cricket team they watch bollywood movies they just like us they are really good indians and they will have a lot of difficulty accepting your criteria of membership so i said that means they do not want openness because if they want openness i'm willing to respect them provided they respect me what's wrong with that i've raised the bar i'm not saying that they have to change their ways i'm not saying they should stop praying the way they do i'm saying that they should respect me for being the way i am and that's all it takes so where this conversation led to is very insightful this person says that look just because they've been here a thousand years even if they cannot accept us because they require not to accept us even if they don't accept us we should still uh, include them uh, amongst us because they've lived here for a very long time and even if they are defeating even if they are defeating our dharma even if they are undermining it we have to respect them because they've lived here for a very long time so i said in that case sri krishna is wrong 
Because uh, why fight the adharma? Why are the Kauravas and Pandas going to fight? Because he, those guys are our cousins. They've lived here for a very long time too. Why should we fight them? So I said that according to you, the early doubts of Arjun were valid. And Krishna wasted time for 18 chapters of the Gita trying to set it right. The, the early, early Arjun says, I don't want to fight, they are my cousins and whatnot, whatever they are like, why should I fight, you know, about this time. Arjun has to, I mean, Krishna has to keep arguing that dharma has to, has to be upheld and a dharma has to be fought. So, so it, according to you, Sri Krishna was wrong. So he thinks about it for a while and he says, well, yes, that's how I feel and uh, Amartya Sen agrees with me. <laughs> So we have, we have a very confused intellectual elite. And I'll close with this point that my book intends to provoke a debate and a discussion and arguments on what should be the grand narrative of India. And I propose a foundation for that, intellectual foundation for that, which is based on dharma civilization as an open architecture that can include everybody that wants to comply with the open architecture and doesn't exclude anybody, but they have to agree to the principles of open architecture and mutual respect. And if they don't, then they are Nastika and they have to be excluded. Thank you.